Folks are coming in. Yay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We see all trickling into the webinar, so we're going to give it maybe another minute or two just until the numbers settle. Yes. It's very nice to see some familiar names in there. Yay. Welcome to everyone. Should we get we're, started? We're, we're settling. Yeah, maybe we can go ahead and get started. That sounds great. All right, here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for taking time out of a busy weeknight evening, evening to come spend some time with us learning about what, it, what goes into list building and more importantly, building a college list for success. I am thrilled to be presenting today with my co-presenter, Deb Ryan who is an independent education consultant with Empower Triangle Tutoring in Cary, North Carolina. And I am Samana Malka. I am an Associate Director of College Counseling at the Westminster Schools in Atlanta. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. So one thing you will hear when you're talking to counselors all the time who are helping students with list building is the importance of fit. And the question to ask is, why is this really important? Because at the end of the day, students are going to college to gain an education. Shouldn't it be enough that they can find the major of their choice and find the classes that they want to take? Well, well, here's how you need to consider it. College is a student's home for the four years that they are going to spend pursuing a degree. And in order for that environment to bring out the best in a student, a few things need to fall into place. So broadly speaking, um, there are three categories. So there's academic fit, there's social fit, and then there's, of course, financial fit. Academic fit is important for the exact same reasons that when your student is in high school, you want them to be in the classes that suit their abilities best. You don't want to place a student in an AP class if they are not ready to handle that rigor. And similarly, you don't want to place a student in an on-level class if they really should be challenged and should be taking on a more rigorous curriculum. So when it comes to academics, beyond just choice of major, it's really important for a student um, to be in classes where they feel challenged, but not overwhelmed, right? Because at the end of the day, four years of college and a student just going to class and coming back and not doing anything else is not going to prepare them for the workforce. So academic fit is especially important. And under academic fit comes things like what kind of schedule is the college on? Are they on a quarter system or a semester system? And these are some of the subtleties and nuances that students don't always pay attention to. So there's a big difference between how a student will absorb content in a semester system versus a quarter system. So on, a, on the quarter system, information is much more, um, comes at the student at a much more rapid pace and students really have to stay on top of it. They will take fewer classes, but in a more condensed time frame, And then they repeat that four times through the year. Whereas the semester system is what students are familiar with in most high schools, where there's a fall semester and a spring semester. Similarly, in social settings, um, if a student is not emotionally vested where they are, which means that they are not waking up in the morning and excited to be somewhere, right? They're excited to see their friends. They're excited to participate in something that brings students together with each other. We find that that is not the kind of environment that the student thrives in. So it's, it's extremely important for a student to be able to find their people on campus, whoever those people are. And lastly, financial fit, right? Um, we, we always try to ensure that a student does not graduate with a mountain of debt because student debt, especially after the student graduates from college, can completely change the quality of life for the student. So we, 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 when we're counseling students, we try to be really careful to see if we can find the best fit for a student where all of these three things come into place. So if you look at the college fit triangle, as we call it, 
it is that little area in the center where financial fit overlaps with academic fit and it overlaps with personal fit. So if you can find a college that meets the needs of the student in these three realms, then you have find a college that fits them. And I will say before a student can even establish fit while they're doing the research, it's important that they know themselves. Because if they don't know who they are and if they don't know who their people are, how would they know if they found them? So a little bit of introspection, reflection, trying to figure out who you are, what kind of academic environment do you thrive in and what who your people are and how much is enough debt for you to handle is important to bring together. So let's jump into financial fit for a minute. And I just want to talk about a few things that go into financial fit and that need to be considered. First is cost of attendance, right? So cost of attendance includes a few different line items within it. So there's tuition and fees, there's room and board, books and supplies, transportation and personal expenses. And if you think about it, let's just say I'm, I'm here in Atlanta and if I had a child that wanted to go to California and go to college in California, transportation expenses are going to look very different than if they chose to go to say UNC Chapel Hill which is just a few hours drive down the road, right? So it's important to consider everything that goes into the cost of attendance. And in that vein, there are tools available to parents and students that they can use to estimate the cost of attendance. One of them is the net price calculator, which you see on the top left. The net price calculator is a financial calculator that was mandated by the federal government to be available on every college's website. It is sometimes buried in the financial aid pages. So the easiest way for you to find the net price calculator for any particular college is to log on to the college's website and in the search bar, you just type in NPC and it usually comes up. So please note that the net price calculator is not a one size fits all you will have to uh, work the numbers for each college individually. And so the net price calculator is a little more involved than this next tool, which is the My Intuition Quick College Cost Estimator, which is on the bottom right. The My Intuition Calculator is really just a quick calculation. It's not asking you to go into depth with your finances, but the net price calculator can and will most times. So usually when you're working the net price calculator, you need to have your taxes ready. You need to have some sense for what family income looks like. And those are numbers you're going to have to plug in. The net price calculator can take you anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to a half hour to work, depending on the school. But just know that this is a tool that is available to parents and it is a great tool to use because what we recommend to students is that if you are going to put a college on your list, and you are going to apply to that school, it should be financially doable. And we're going to talk about what financial doability really means. So I, I want to point this out because there is a big difference between a family's ability to pay versus their willingness to pay. So a family's ability to pay is established by two financial aid forms. They are the FAFSA and the CSS profile. So the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. It is used by all colleges. And if you have been listening to the news this year, <laughs> the FAFSA was a bit of a debacle. Um, and colleges are still reeling under, you know, getting data late from FAFSA, putting financial aid packages together. But for everybody who's watching, who's going to apply to college next year, we believe things are going to be so much better. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, so the FAFSA establishes something called the Student Aid Index. If any of y'all are familiar with the FAFSA, in, in previous years, it used to be called the EFC, the Expected Family Contribution, but now it's called the Student Aid Index. And so the FAFSA, once you enter all of your tax information in there, will generate the Student Aid Index, which is what colleges will use to determine financial need, right? The CSS profile is similar to the FAFSA, but it is used primarily by private schools. There are only a couple of public schools that use it, um, Georgia Tech and Michigan, namely. But the CSS profile goes into much more depth when it's talking about finances. So it's asking you to declare your assets, 
uh, a home, uh, you know, a whole lot of other things. But I'm pointing this out to tell you that colleges will use these two tools to estimate what they believe is a family's ability to pay, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that a family is willing to pay that amount. So if the FAFSA and the CSS, let's just say, establish a student aid index of $60,000 per child per year, and it says that you as a family, based on your income, can pay $60,000 a year, you as parents might say, wait a minute, I don't think that justifies a four-year education, right? That's, that's something to consider. So when you are having conversations, and I'm speaking to parents at this point, it really is important for you to have an open and honest conversation with your child. We're not asking you to open up your, <laughs> your statements and you know, share the details of your finances, but it is good practice for you as a parent to let your child know what is doable and what is not financially, so that when they're adding a college to the list, they, they feel comfortable that every college on their list is financially doable. And consequently, when they receive an acceptance from that college, they can actually be excited about it. Over to you, Deb. So one of the things, and we're going to switch gears a little bit now to talk about sort of where do we even start? I think this is one of the things that can be very overwhelming for students when they think about where should I go to college? And I think one of the things that happens is students tend to then just listen to their peers, to their peers' older siblings, and then they end up saying, okay, well, there's basically five schools that everyone in my high school applies to, so I'm going to apply to those five schools. The beauty of the United States is that we have thousands of colleges, thousands of colleges. And this is a really great breakdown. So there's a really pretty balanced uh, half and half between public universities, which are places like, again, UNC Chapel Hill, Georgia Tech, the University of California system, and then private colleges, which are places like Emory or Duke or Elon, Guilford College in North Carolina that are private colleges. So uh, between those two, there are almost 3,000 colleges. There are 3,000 colleges that students can choose from. The other category here is community colleges. And we're going to talk about those in a minute as, as an option for some students as well, as either a beginning pathway or as, a, as their college career. And then for-profit colleges are about 900 colleges. We're not going to be talking about those tonight. So that's one of the things I think for students to, to think about at the very beginning, which is I have lots of choices, right? So when I'm thinking about where am I going to land where I will want to engage with my professors and where I'm going to want to join all the clubs and activities and where I can jump in and I'm going to be excited to be. There are so many different options for you. So you are not limited to the five places that everybody has a sweatshirt in your high school. You know, there are just so many choices out there. And so the guiding questions are really to think about, and I assume I talked about this introspection piece and I, we can't, stress how important taking some time for self-reflection really is. You really want to start thinking about where do I learn best? Am I going to be happy in a classroom with 200 other people in a lecture hall? Or do I really want to be in a seminar where I'm going to have access to my professor and there's only other 20 people in my classroom? Do I want to be on a campus where I potentially need to take a bus from one side of the campus to the other side of the campus? Or do I want to be somewhere where I can just walk and I can see my classroom from my dorm? Do I want to make sure that I can join the ski club? If you go to a school that does not have anywhere near skiing or is in somewhere very hot where there, there's not probably not going to be a ski club. So if that's something that's important to you, it's thinking about what are the ways that I want to engage with this environment, which is very likely going to be home for the next four years. So it's really sort of expanding your thought process to moving beyond sweatshirt schools or, or bumper sticker schools into the kinds of places where you are gonna feel at home, where you are gonna feel comfortable and excited to jump in and where you are going to really find your path. I think what, sometimes students think that, that there's a point A to point B to point C in life, that we just have this linear pathway in life. We don't necessarily have those linear pathways. What we want you to be thinking about is <clears throat> where is going to open up possibilities for me 
And of those possibilities, where am I going to be excited to jump in and take advantage of those and find those opportunities? Um, and then you can skip to the next slide. So I, we do want to talk for one minute about two-year colleges and about trade schools, because those are also something that, that students often think about. So many of you, some students might be already taking dual enrollment classes, so you already sort of have a sense of community colleges. But I think it is important to understand that two-year colleges are a wonderful pathway for many students, either with, a, with an end degree of an Associate of Arts or an Associate of Science, or as a way to get a lot of the baseline coursework that you're going to take done before you then transfer to a four-year university. And there are some wonderful, I taught at a community college for eight years, there are some wonderful benefits to community colleges. They're typically much lower tuition and fees for students for whom maybe high school wasn't great. It wasn't the best experience. It's a really great chance to improve your transcript because very often when you transfer from a community college, they're only going to look at your community college trans your transcript from community college. They're not going to look at your high school record. So if your high school record is maybe not what you hoped it would be, community college might be a great place for you to sort of turn things around and give you some space and time to really figure out how to manage a, a college courses. Typically lower living cost, really great flexibility. For many students for whom finance in college, again, we've talked a lot about financial fit, right? We, we want you to think about how am I affording all of this? Community college can be a great way for you to work and earn funds while you're in school. Also, very typically, this is important to note, two-year colleges, community colleges typically have much smaller class sizes. So if that's a better environment for you where you don't, you, it's not going to be good for you to be in a, in a huge lecture hall, then a community college is an option to consider as well. And then you can pop ahead. We do want to talk about trade schools. These have been in the news quite a bit recently, and they are, again, another option for students to think about post-graduation. We do think that there's a couple of things that people should understand about, about trade schools in general, the tech, trade or technical schools. The very career-intensive curriculum. It can typically take one to two years. You go straight into the workforce. So these are really ways to get skills, that are gonna provide you with a job that you will have immediately upon graduation. Again, much less expensive from college, but a very important thing to note is that technical and trade school credits almost never transfer to a four-year school. So this is not necessarily a pathway to undertake if going to a four-year college is sort of your long-term goal. Those credits are not necessarily going to transfer over. And so you're, you're going to end up spending money to get this degree or certification, and then you'll have to continue to get more certification and, and credits in order to get into um, a, a four-year scholarship college. So it's just a very different kind of pathway. So it's great for some students, but it's important to note that it's not necessarily, if this is the pathway you take, it's going to be a little bit harder to back end then into going to a four-year school. So. so let's talk a minute about the, for a minute, about the differences between a college and a university. So universities serve both graduate and undergraduate students. And colleges, on the other hand, will serve only undergraduate students. So um, if you look at some of the larger universities, because they have graduate students on campus, it's very possible that TAs might sometimes be teaching classes. And so if that is something that does not float your boat, then you might want to keep that in mind. Um, on the other hand, at colleges, because the undergraduate students are the administration's focus, you will find that all classes are taught by professors and there really is a lot of emphasis on the development of the student as a whole. So definitely a distinction to keep in mind. So a few things, now we're diving right into FIT and talking about the different pieces that really go into FIT. We talked about financial FIT, right? So we're talking about cost. Um, just know that the price that you see on a college's website which is um, you know, tuition and room and board is ticket price. And most families will never pay ticket price because um, you, know, you, could, you could receive merit scholarships, they could, you could meet the threshold for need-based aid. So there are very few families that will actually pay what you are seeing on a college's website. So don't let that number scare you away. 
A few other things that I do want to point out, there is this myth out there that private schools are always going to be much more expensive than public universities. And I will say that is not the case. Because if you look at private institutions, private institutions are sometimes the ones with big endowments and deeper pockets. And consequently, they're able to offer more in terms of financial aid in grants and scholarships, which, are, which is money that doesn't need to be paid back. So it's really important for families to work the net price calculator and to not get turned off by a number they see on the website, right? And once you crunch the numbers and you figure out how much it's going to cost you, there really should be an open conversation between parents and students about how that tuition and room and board cost is going to be paid. Is the student going to take on some loans? Um, is the family going to pay everything? Because you really don't want that hanging over a student's head. It can, it can cause a lot of stress for a student to constantly be worrying about money as they go through college. And so it's, it's much better if they go in knowing what their responsibility is and how that's going to be met. As far as scholarship money goes, please know that not all colleges will offer merit scholarships, especially if you're looking at the IVs and some of the tier one schools. Think about it. They really have no incentive to offer students merit scholarship money because the pool that's applying to them is so strong and they are such high achieving students, they really don't need to be offering merit scholarships to students to get them to attend. So where you will find stronger and meatier merit scholarships are usually among the mid-tier schools. Also, for students, it's important to note that as a student, if you are a big fish in a small pond, which means that as an applicant, you are bringing more to the table than the average applicant, which means maybe your transcript is much stronger than everybody else's. You are doing a lot outside of the classroom. You have a lot of leadership on your resume. When you are a big fish in a small pond, those are the types of schools that are going to offer you money and ask you to come to them. And along with merit scholarship money could also come things like admittance to the honors college and maybe some research money, mentorship, all of which are good things and which really make a large institution much smaller and it allows a student to really go out and explore that potential. And the last thing I want to say about need-based aid is there is no set threshold for need-based aid. That threshold varies from college to college. So at the IVs, for example, any family making under $200,000 a year qualifies for need-based aid. But that threshold is not necessarily the same at other schools, right? So when you're doing your research and trying to establish fit and financial fit and cost of attendance, these are things that you should consider. As far as size goes, Deb touched on that before. Um, you really need to know yourself. Do you do better in a large classroom setting or a small classroom setting? I will never forget the first time I set foot on the University of Maryland's campus in College Park. And I, I was so overwhelmed. The large green space in the middle, <laughs> I, I looked at it from one end to the other and I was thinking, oh my God, I could, I would have to plan so well in advance to get to class on time because that is not a trek you can make in five minutes, right? Um, Rutgers, Rutgers is an incredibly large school. They have five different campuses and sometimes just depending on the day of the week, you might have to take a bus from one campus and to another to take your classes. Do you have an appetite for that? Would you prefer just walking to class? <laughs> These are things that really go into you thriving and truly enjoying your experience on campus versus um, maybe not so much. Also, the last thing I'll say about size is it truly feeds into whether you will function independently and thrive in that setting or not. Because when you're sitting in a classroom with 300 other students taking a freshman class, know that your professor is really not going to know you individually unless you make an effort. So at these larger institutions, students really have to make an effort to go to office hours, to go find if it's a TA or a health session that will help them when they're struggling academically and to establish those relationships with professors because you will need letters of recommendation at some point in your four-year career, right? So is that your cup of tea or is it not? So things to think about. 
I want to talk, I'm just going to go briefly back to the question about merit scholarships, because I think one of the things that people don't necessarily know is that many colleges are very transparent about their merit scholarships. And if you Google the name of the college, merit scholarships, it will take you typically to a page that says, this is what we offer. And it, very often it will have a thing that says, if you have a GPA of this and a test score of this, this is how much money that you can potentially get. It does not mean that your child will automatically be admitted if they have those statistics, very important to note. But there are ways to already look at who has merit, who doesn't, and what kinds of merit is available. So a lot of the stuff, sometimes you have to dig a little bit, but it should be on the websites. Speaking of things that you sometimes have to dig for is uh, <laughs> the median SAT and ACT scores. So again, as we're thinking about building your list, these are three of the things that you sort of want to think about. And, I, and as Simona was talking about, are you a big fish in a small pond? Or are you a tiny fish in a ginormous pond? Uh, the median SAT and ACT can actually be a really great indicator of where you will land in terms of your both your admissibility and your potential to get what we call the goodies, right? So honors college potentially, merit scholarships potentially. So if you are suddenly looking at schools, and again, if you Google the median SAT for the name of the school, it will typically take you somewhere that gives you those numbers. They might not always be perfectly accurate. And we could go into a whole discussion. The past couple of years of test optional admissions mean that they're a little bit skewed, but it will at least give you a range to look at, right? So if your child is looking at a lot of schools where their SAT score is well below that middle 50%, you really wanna, again, have those conversations about, A, we need to make sure that you're applying to schools where you could potentially get in, and B, do you potentially wanna be going to school with a lot of students who are super high aggressively high achievers and and are just purely academic is is that your jam is that going to make you happy to be in that environment do you love to study all the time or do you not want to study all the time uh there's definitely some schools that are work hard work hard right there's that's just kind of the case at those schools and so really understanding what the role of the other parts of your life and having balance in your life, what that looks like for you, I think is very important. And, and I am not a huge believer in test scores, but I do think for many students, this is just a way to start those conversations about fit. Do I fit in terms of admissibility? Do I fit in terms of the academic pressures that maybe students are under at this school? What does that look like? What does that student body look like academically? The school spirit piece is always fascinating to me because I live in the middle of Duke, NC State and Chapel Hill land, <laughs> which is always delightful. And just, we, my, my daughter uh, went to Duke and our son went to UNC for graduate school. And when they play each other, we pretend it's not happening. No <laughs> one about it. Many of my students will say, I want to go to a big football school. And I say, that is great. Here, however, is a question. Football, for example, is maybe five Saturdays during the entire school year. Maybe at home, home games are maybe five Saturdays. What are you going to do every other day that is not one of the five home football games? It's also important to note that you can always go, if you love a school's team and you wanna to go to their football games, no one is preventing you from doing that. You can go to the football games. The big question is, is the rest of the environment? So are the classes, is the school size, is the major, is the people fit? Does the rest of it fit you as well, right? So I completely understand wanting the raw raw. I think it can be wonderful to experience that is really extraordinary. But that maybe shouldn't be the overarching emphasis in your search, because again, it's a very limited, tiny piece of the entirety of your four-year experience. And you can still wear the colors and you can still go to the football games if that really matters to you. So it's really thinking about what role does that play for you? I think that's the key ingredient there. And then location really matters. Sometimes students say, I want to be as far away as possible from home <laughs> at the beginning of their college search. 
And by the end, they're like, I don't think I should, I want to be further away than I can drive. I'm like, okay, so we're going to have a range of possibilities here. But I think that really taking into consideration flying versus driving is a really important thing to understand. If you go to school somewhere where you would need to fly home, that is a whole other layer of transportation needs and costs and timing that can make it just more difficult to actually get home. So it's a it's a big piece of do you want to be close to home or far from home? I would also say many of my students who live in Raleigh at the beginning refuse to look at NC State University because they live right next to it. And I say, well, please go do a tour. And so even if you live next to a university, what happens is when they go and do the tour, they say, wow, I had no idea that NC State had all of those things. Living next to a college and understanding what's at the college can be two entirely different things. And so giving maybe the school down the road a chance is not the worst idea as well. And then weather matters. Uh, my daughter right now is at Penn State and she <laughs> does not like the cold. She's there for graduate school and she cannot wait to not have to wear. She has a jacket called Big Agnes and she is very <laughs> ready to get rid of Big Agnes. The weather actually matters. Again, this is gonna be home for you. So what kinds of, do you wanna have four seasons? Do you want it to be 67 degrees every day? What do you want that to look like? It really matters as well. And then majors and extracurriculars. We wanna talk about this for a second as well. So majors matter. If you really wanna be an engineer, it does not make sense to apply to a school that doesn't have engineering. This doesn't mean that you have to know exactly what you want to be when you're 17. Many, many, the majority of people change their majors. However, you want to make sure that the schools that you're looking in do have the potentialities for you. So if you're interested in engineering, if you're interested in business, you want to make sure that you're looking at schools that have both engineering and business, right? Looking at a school that has no engineering is not going to help you pursue that pathway potentially. Many, many colleges now as well have undecided or explore choice studies kinds of majors that are really a way for you to figure out what you want to do before you declare a major. So that's one of the pieces that you want to be looking at when you're looking at schools as well is when do I have to declare a major? What support systems are in place to help me figure out what my major potentially could be? What kinds of timelines do those look like? What are the first year experiences sort of look like? to really understand kind of what that those pathways might be for you. Do you wanna have hands-on learning? Do you wanna be able to study abroad? Do you wanna have internships? What are the possibilities at the different institutions that you're looking at? And so this requires some deep dive research into the universities. Almost all colleges, again, are gonna have lots of information about this on their websites because this is how they draw people in. This is they wanna show off the great things that they have. But again, you want to think about, do I just want to go to school for four years and go to classes and do my thing? Do I want to do research? Do I want to do a co-op? Do I want to go to Belize for a semester? What are those possibilities that you would like to experience? Which colleges have all of those possibilities? And then the extracurriculars matters. Again, I talked about ski club for a second, which is funny because I don't ski at all. Um, but extracurriculars matter. Is Greek life important to you? does Bama's rush talk, is it the greatest thing that you've ever seen? Or is it the thing that you are like, please keep me away from that? Really thinking about what do I want my life to look like? Because again, it's going to be home. It's going to be where you're living. Do I, do they have the cl classes that I'm interested in? Do they have the clubs that I'm interested in? Do they have the kinds of things that maybe I'll take a chance? Maybe I'll learn to play Quidditch on the mall. What are the kinds of things that you want to make sure you're doing to maintain that balance in your life and to enrich your experience, right? What are the things that you want to be able to explore? Which colleges have those pieces as well? So, um, so we keep saying that college is going to be your home away from home for four years when you're there. So housing and food is important. Um, especially if you are a student that suffers from allergies or you have dietary restrictions, um, you want to make sure that the college has something to offer for you. And how willing are they to support you if you have just some really funky dietary need that is not, not the norm and 
you know, are you going to be able to eat on campus? Also, support on campus is important. We're not just talking about emotional support and academic support. Um, there's a whole lot that goes into you feeling safe and feeling like your needs are met. Healthcare is one. Um, what kind of healthcare services do they have on campus? Career prep is important as well, because at the end of the day, you are pursuing a four-year degree so that you can be hired at the other end, right? So how willing are they to help you? Who comes on campus to recruit? And more importantly, whom are these resources available to? Can you access them starting freshman year? Or do you have to wait until you're in your third year or fourth year to access some of these um, services? And so now that we've talked about fit a whole lot and we've talked about the things that go into fit and that you should be researching, we want to offer you some sources for research. Um, at the end of this presentation on the last slide, I do have a QR code which will take you to a document that has all of these resources listed with hyperlinks. So um, please know that that's coming. The first two on this list, the fifth guide and the college finder are both books. And so this is not something that will be available to you online. I really like the fifth guide to colleges, which by the way, it's been around forever. <laughs> but what I really like about the fifth guide is it doesn't tell you the things that you will find on a website. It really talks to you about culture and traditions on campus. And one really neat feature of the FISC guide is it has something called overlaps. So let's just say you visited NC State and you loved NC State and you're thinking, okay, what other schools are out there that are similar to NC State? If you look it up on the FISC guide, um, the, in the bottom right-hand corner, there's something called overlaps and it'll tell you what other colleges are around that are very similar to NC State. So your list can grow in that sense. The College Finder book is, is a brilliant book that's put together by Steve Antonoff and a colleague of mine, Jay McCann. And what I like about the College Finder book is that it will actually sort schools by very specific criteria. So if, and by majors as well. So if you're looking for a college that does really well with an economics major and has a great econ program, you can look up the book and look for colleges that have good econ majors. Computer science is a whole nother ball game, right? So the College Finder does a really good job of that. The common data set is getting into the weeds a little bit <laughs> with data. So I'll, I'll put it out there for anybody that, that really nerds out on data. So the common data set is something that every college will publish and it, it houses data from the freshman class that they just accepted. So they will go into all kinds of things like first year retention. They will talk about the middle 50%. They will give you numbers for what percentage of students submitted test scores. So you can really get into the weeds with this, but if you have an appetite for that kind of data, you will need to Google it and you can Google it by typing in college name, CDS, and I think the most recent one that will become available is probably 2022, right Deb? Yeah, I just put in UNC, the link to UNC's uh, Chapel Hills, their common data set, just so people can see it's in the chat, just so people can see kind of what it looks like. It is very much getting into the weeds, <laughs> but it's, it is the thing upon which many of us who are in college counseling, we use these all the time to really look at particularly median SAT, ACT, number of students who were put on the wait list, people who came off the wait list. It's really amazing data. It is a little bit behind, but it does give us some clarity on sort of how admission trends are working. So I just put that yeah. in the chat. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. And, and the next few data sources, so there's college data, college raptor, college results, college scorecard. They will all allow you to vet schools um, just in one way or another. Some will have a bigger focus on one, one area, some on the other, but between all of them, College Navigator, Big Future, all of these sources are great sources um, for you to really dive in and do your research. We also put the net price calculator and my intuition calculator on there. And the last one on this list is something called Campus Reel. And Campus Reel is a website that houses videos that students on campus have put together. These are not polished, like edited, doctored up videos. These are really raw videos, but you're really seeing the campus and life on campus through a student's eyes. 
So once you have done your research on the website and you've crunched numbers and all of that, if you really want to get a feel for what student life is like on campus, I would strongly recommend Campus Reel as a resource. So I'm just going to talk about some of the other maybe ways that for students to really understand colleges. College tours are wonderful. They are an amazing way for students to really get a sense of, of the campus. It's great if you can go while school is in session. So uh, again, I mentioned my daughter's at Penn State. When I dropped her off at Penn State for graduate school, it was the summer and there was no one there and it was peaceful and we did a five mile walk. And then I went back in October and I've never seen so many people in one spot in my life. It was packed everywhere. So ha being able to do that is, is a really great way to see like, is this my vibe? Does this number of people overwhelm me? What do I think about looking at the mall and thinking about how long I have to walk across this campus? But for many families, actually visiting a college on campus is not sustainable, is not achievable. There are, however, wonderful. One of the good things that came out of COVID, I would say, is that NACAC, which is the National Association for College Admission Counseling, came up with a whole series of virtual college fairs. So they are, and you can go into the NACAC website, we're going to put it into our, um, into the resources, but virtual college fairs are a way that you can sit for about five hours or however much of that time you want to, and listen to admissions offices do presentations about their schools. So you can hear about a number of schools all at once. Those are a great thing. Many colleges also, because of COVID, started to offer virtual tours on their websites. And so they are a really fun way, again, for you to be in the comfort of your own home and be able to start to just get a sense of what do these campuses even look like? I think sometimes students have preconceived notions about what a campus might be, whether that comes from social media or wherever it comes from, but actually seeing the real buildings can be a revelation. For, for us in North Carolina, I think students particularly they have very preconceived notions about UNC Charlotte because I think they think it's an urban school because it's, it's going to look a certain way. And then they get there and, or they look at a virtual tour and they're like, it is not what I thought it was going to be. That's what I hear all the time about UNC Charlotte because it's this campus on a hill. It's very sequestered. It's beautiful. And so just starting to even see the campuses, virtual tours are often available on colleges' websites. Again, that's going to be one of your best resources for information. I think that reading a school newspaper, even though they're all digital now, so it's not actually even a paper, but looking at the school's newspaper can be an amazing way to get a sense of what's happening on campus. One of my favorites is the Daily Tar Heel. It is the, the campus newspaper for the UNC Chapel Hill. And you can really get a sense of, are people happy? What are they writing about? What's new? What's different? Some of the journalism for the school newspapers is a astonishingly good and thorough. And so it's, a, again, it's just another way to see what are people saying about the school? Do they seem happy? What are the controversies? What are the things they're excited about? I always strongly recommend for my students to follow colleges and admissions offices on social media, Twitter, SnapX, Instagram, whatever that looks like for you, <clears throat> whatever new one is probably out like in the next two weeks. <laughs> that I won't know about. Um, social media is a great way, again, to hear, do they have open houses? Are there new admissions policies? What are they excited about? South Carolina, University of South Carolina, I follow them on Facebook and they just showed, they had this amazing series of events. They, they showed movies in the football stadium. I just thought, I wanna go to all of these things, but you get a sense of what is life like on campus. I think that the clubs and organizations pages are very important. And again, all you have to do is you can Google the name of the college, clubs and organizations, and it's going to take you to the page that lists. These are the things that you could potentially get engaged with. And then the final thing is, again, Google name of the college and list of majors. It's going to show you what could I potentially major in in this institution? Does it have the things that I'm interested in? And then we're just going to go through, see, these are some new apps that I love. So there's a, a few um, websites in here and a couple apps. So this is an app that came out, I think, a year ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, 18 months ago. It's This is really for students. It is one of my favorite things in the world. It is free. And what the Loper app will ask you to do is it's going to ask you to set up a profile. And then it's going to ask you a ton of questions. 
And I love their questions because these are really going to be the kinds of things that we've just been talking about. What matters to you more than what doesn't matter to you? Do you really, are you excited about the sports? Are you excited about the academics? Do you want to be how far away from home? It's going to ask you so many questions. It also provides individualized quizzes and it, it also gives really tremendous information about different majors. This is what an environmental studies major looks like. This is the kinds of jobs that you could potentially have from it. It's just full of information. And at the end, when you kind of go through all of the questions, it will give you some matches. And my favorite part of this is that when it gives you the matches, the first piece of information it gives you is not the name of the school. The first piece of information they give you is sort of, this is what the school looks like. This is the size. This is where it is. And if you say, that seems really interesting to me, you click on it and it flips over and it, then it gives you the name of the school. And I love that because they're really trying to help students move beyond the brand names, the names that are always in the media, the sweatshirt schools, to really think about what's a great school for me. My pathway is different from everyone else's. I think the Loper app is fantastic for helping students understand what's a great fit for them. And that's the fit is really the at the very forefront of their mission. So the Loper app is fantastic. I love it. This is one of my favorite things too. So Common App actually has a, an explore page. So for many students, the way that they will apply to most of their colleges is through this app called the Common App. It's the Common Application. This is really fun and it's very pretty, which is part of why I love it. It lists, it has access to all of the colleges that belong to the Common App. I think right now it's 1,081. It goes up and down every day lately. But on the left-hand side, you can see that there are parameters and those parameters go further down. And so you can sort those colleges by state, by region, by campus size, by public or private, many different kinds of parameters. And when, you, when it gives you the list, when it gives you sort of the schools for you to look at, when you click on a school, First of all, it gives you great images, so tons of pictures. Very often there's going to be a virtual tour embedded in that page as well. And then it also gives you, it's your first look at a school. So it will give you information and background on the school. It'll give you their programming. It'll give you the link to the admissions page, link to the financial aid page. It'll often tell you how you can visit if they have virtual tours. So it's your first look at schools. Um, this is a great starter point, I think, for a lot of students, particularly for us, I think, in the South and the Southeast, because many of our institutions are common app schools. So it's a great way to kind of see all of the schools that might be around you that you haven't necessarily considered before. I, I love this page. It's one of my favorites. Uh, we talked about Big Future earlier. Big Future is a part of College Board. And this is a way that you can do research by lots of different kinds of categories. Um, and sometimes you can combine the categories. It does go through pretty much every college in the United States. So sometimes you're going to get these huge lists. <laughs> when you do biology major, you get this ginormous list. So it can be this, I think, big future can be a little bit harder to narrow down. But it is, there are ways, again, they have parameters on the right-hand side that you can sort of narrow down by different aspects of what you're looking for. But again, it is, it's probably one of the biggest databases that they work from. And so this is, again, another helpful way for students to search. And then this is a very, very new. This is, um, Soundboard is a program that's been developed by some young entrepreneurs at MIT. And I've actually had the pleasure of working with them on some of the pieces of this. So this is a free college list builder. And the thing that I think is amazing about this, this links to a page called College Navigator, which comes from the Department of Education, which is, to be frank, one of the ugliest websites known to man. It is just unattractive. And I think for teenagers, they look at it and they're like, what is this even? So what the wonderful young men at um, Soundboard have done is they have created this amazing thing that this actually gets the information, it draws the information from the College Navigator database, but it turns it into a beautiful spreadsheet for students. And so you can look, you can search by any of these six parameters, by location, by campus setting. They've just recently added the majors piece to this, which I think is really exciting, by the size of the campus, by the admissions rate, and by the test scores. And it has these really great um, bars that you can slide over back and forth to see 
to set your parameters, it's really fun to play with. But the thing I love about this the most as well is that once you sort of put in your parameters and it runs the list for you, it creates a spreadsheet that you can then keep that has all of the data from College Navigator in that spreadsheet. And it's just a great way for students to start to really think about medians, majors, it has the, it'll have the cost of attendance. It has lots of information in it already. And I do wanna just mention for any school counselors or counselors who are on here, if you have a .edu um, email address for counselors, you can use this repeatedly over and over and over as much as you want to. For students, it's typically going to be, you get 10 free college lists. So that's kind of how they've established it. But Soundboard is very new. I think it's very exciting. And it it just makes something that is very complicated by itself, College Navigator, really easy for students to use. So I love it. So we are going to finish out this presentation with talking by talking about outcomes and what that means and how a list should actually come together. So I will say that regardless of whether students will acknowledge this or not, applying to college is an emotional process, right? And when a student gets accepted, it is a validation of everything they've done in high school. And if they get denied, it is a negation of the same. So as much as we can try to say otherwise, that is truly how it lands for a lot of students. So when students are building lists, we ideally want them to get more yeses than they do no's from colleges. And whether that happens or not is completely a function of how you build the list. So if you are putting two likely schools on there, and likely schools are schools at which you will most likely get admitted, because you are far exceeding the average numbers for the uh, any applicant they're looking at. If you're only going to put two likely schools and the rest of the schools on your list are all reaches, that is not a good way to build the list because chances are you will probably get more no's than yeses. So we really want to see balance in how the students build their list and what balance looks like ideally is about 20% of your schools being likely schools 20% being reach and 60% being target. I will say the average number of schools that a student applies to is usually about eight. If we have students applying to specialized programs like the SND programs, then it makes sense that their list would be a little bit longer than that. But I think within that list, if you can create certain criteria which the schools need to meet, those criteria should be, number one, there should be balance in the list. Number two, every school that you're putting on the list should be financially doable. And number three, you should be happy attending those schools. If you're not going to be happy attending those schools, do not waste your time and money applying to them. Because if it is not a viable option, you have just wasted your time. And what I tell students is the way you vet your list is you look at every school that you're putting on there in isolation and say, if I only got in here and nowhere else, would I be happy attending? And if the answer is yes, that college stays on the list. If the answer is no, I'm going to tell you to go back to the drawing board. The last thing I want to talk about is decision timelines. And here's what I mean by that. We're, we're going to dive into the nitty gritty a little bit here when we're talking about deadlines like early action, regular decision and early decision. So I'll say this, early action and early decision, those deadlines usually come up in October and early November. Regular decision is the last deadline and that usually comes up in January. So for most schools, what we like to see is that students are applying to at least one or two schools, early action, which is not a commitment, which, which will give them or render a decision usually by winter break, right? So if you look at UGA, for example, UGA always releases their decisions the Friday before Thanksgiving. And sometimes it's really nice and it almost takes the stress off a little bit for students to know that they got into one school. So what I'm saying all of this to say, as you are putting your list of schools together, you should also be paying attention to deadlines and you shouldn't apply in such a way that all of your schools become regular decision schools. Because what that means then is you are going to be waiting until at least March before you get your first decision in. 
And that is not a good place to be emotionally. So ideally, you want to apply to at least a couple of early action schools, which will render a decision early enough. So at least you know you have something in the bag and preferably likely schools. So with that, we're going to get to the last slide where we want to point out where the resources are housed. So the recording of this webinar is going to be on the SACAC website. So if you go to SACAC and you go to resources and grants, and you will see past webinars and presentations on the left. So this one will be housed there soon. And there are also a whole lot of other webinars of presentations done in the past that you can absolutely dip into and learn from. And lastly, this is the QR code for the document that houses all of the resources that we just talked about. So I'm gonna leave the slide up there for maybe another minute or so, if you all want to grab that QR code. And now we're going to open it up to questions. Thank you everyone for your attention. I think that we've answered most of them in the chat or in the Q and A. Um, okay. Yeah, I think we're in pretty good shape. If others we're, have okay. questions, please put them in. Um, the thing I would sort of say as well to students and to parents is at the end of all of this, for students to really think about embracing the colleges that have embraced them. That's a message that I tell my students all the time. And what I mean by that is how you're treated in the admissions process, I think speaks volumes about how you'll be treated when you get onto a campus. And if a school at the end of all of this, when you're really making your decision in the spring of your senior year, if a school has clearly shown you that they are embracing you for who you are, which is they have offered you an merit scholarships or if they've they've reached out individually or if they someone remembered your name when you went on campus or if you were able to talk to a professor that's a school where you are probably going to thrive because they are already showing that they are embracing you for who you are and so i think it's important for students to know you, you don't have to try to be someone that you aren't in any of this process that's why we talked about that self reflection that's why we've talked about fit you really want to think about who you truly are authentically. Where are you going to be happy? Trying to, to mold yourself for what you think a college wants means that no one is being honest on either sides of those that, of that equation. You really want a college to see you for who you are and say, you belong here. And we want you to be a part of our community and what you are going to enrich us all. And so that's really one of the things for students to think about is where are they going to authentically thrive? Where have they been embraced? Where are they going to then in turn embrace the community? So, and I think there's one more question that came in. Open. Um, uh, can you get to that there? Yeah, I, I can see it says, do you have any specific suggestions for list building for Latino students, black students and ELL students? I have thought, some thoughts. Do you wanna to talk to that first, Sumina? Um, gosh, I'm thinking. Um, I, I think for black students, um, HBCUs, if you would consider HBCUs would be a good one. Um, and I'm trying to think of a specific, I don't know if there's a specific resource that will kind of collect all of them and allow you to research, but I think just um, getting on the websites, I can't really think of anything else for yeah, HBCUs. So, yeah, I mean, I would say for, there are some great organizations. So um, the, the, for, for Latino students, Latinx Ed, which is in North Carolina, but Latinx Ed is a great organization that has just tremendous resources for lots of different kinds of students, but they are also sort of a pathway into other organizations for Hispanic serving institutions. I think one of the things that's really important for students to look at is diversity on campus. And so typically that is something that's often in the common data set. It's also something that student that will be either on the college's website that students can ask during uh, virtual admissions events that they can ask if they're on a tour, but for students to really think about, um, wh again, where are they going to feel at home? And so what does that the student population look like? Are they going to find a place that they feel safe, that they feel embraced? And so there are other kinds of, I think for, for different 
communities, there are sort of different organizations for, for Jewish students. They can definitely look at Hillel and see which are the colleges that have really strong Hillel programs. Um, I think it's it, a lot of it though for students is really doing some deep dive research into the specific institutions and what kinds of um, uh, places are gonna feel like home that they are gonna feel embraced and safe, so. The one other thing I'll add to that is colleges that really put an effort into building diversity will do sometimes fly-ins for students and into specialized programs. And these are students who would be in their junior year. Mm -hmm. And if you know that a college offers something like that, mm -hmm. it's definitely worth taking advantage of because you know that they're embracing diversity and they want to bring students with diverse backgrounds onto campus. Mm -hmm. um, some of that, I mean, it, it, it became a little more difficult, I think, for some colleges to do things just because of the SCOTUS decision and the Supreme Court decision and the decision they made to scrub race and ethnicity um, and colleges using that in admissions. But I think there are a lot of programs. And if you see that there are programs that colleges offer, you know that that would be a good place for a student to be. One other thing I'll point out, there is um, when you look at some of these larger scholarship programs like Questbridge, if you look at the partner schools under Questbridge, you know that they will be embracing students from diverse backgrounds, right? So it might not be, I mean, Questbridge is something that students can definitely apply to, but even if you're trying to get a sense for schools that um, are welcoming students from different ethnic backgrounds and also from different socioeconomic backgrounds, like that would be one place to look as well, the Questbridge scholarship. Um, I also just put in, there's a really fantastic book um, that's called The Black Family's Guide to College Admissions, a Conversation About Ed Education, Parenting, and Race. It's a really fantastic book for families um, coming who really want to think about the entirety of that process. And it's just a, it's a phenomenal resource as well, I would say. Um, so the question was, where can you find these flying programs? I would just Google it. And colleges that will offer it, will the names will come up. And then you want to dive into each of those colleges' websites individually to research them. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's one other question we'll answer really quickly. Um, how much weightage do colleges give on volunteering hours or community work apart from GPA and SAT score? That is a whole question about holistic admissions. And actually I know on the SACAC website, on the in the college workshops, there is an entire uh, webinar that's about holistic admissions. And so I they they do give it a lot of weight, but that is an entirely different discussion. But I would say, again, I would look at the SACAC, the other phenomenal workshops that have been presented by SACAC um, about all of these other kinds of pieces. There's essay building, there's financial aid, there's holistic admissions. It's truly, truly an amazing um, uh, resource. And then would financial aid also apply to further studies after a bachelor's degree? Graduate school financial aid is completely different ballgame. It's kind of what I would say there. <laughs> Yeah, it's totally yeah. different. Yeah. Uh, well, it's 8.03. So we want to make sure that we are being respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much again for being with us tonight. It's always so wonderful to see Sumna. And uh, we hope that this has been helpful for you. Again, we uh, I think that the the other SACAC workshops are truly amazing resources. And uh, we hope that if this raises more questions for you, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to, to SACAC. Um, to uh, Sumana or to myself to see if there are other questions that we can answer. But we hope that this has just given you some things to think about as you head into the this process with your child, which is really exciting. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much.